Uh, nice to meet you if I uh, haven't had a chance. Um, uh, it is an honor to be a part of this uh, community. Um, it's also an honor to be a part of the family that I have the privilege of loving and supporting and annoying. Um, my wife here, uh, three children, two of whom are going to stand right now because of their rebellious nature and not listening to their pastor and standing up when 25 or 30 and younger were to, uh, to stand. So stand up right there. I ain't going any further until you stand up. Samuel, uh, a dynamic educator up at a high school called El Camino Real. I'm going to go on his second year and uh, is moving out in a couple weeks. Praise the Lord. We will miss him. Uh, our youngest daughter, Sophia, right there, just finished the sophomore year at Torrance High School. Uh, doing really well with almost every single thing she's involved with there um, as an athlete and a student and uh, someone involved with uh, school council. Um, I'm proud to say that I've thought about the reality that I, if I could, I would really enjoy being a good friend to each of the three of my children. I'm not their friend, um, I'm their dad, but there is that beauty of being able to think about how cool they are, how special they are, and how the, the way I know them, I would really be honored to be their friend, but I am their dad. And there is a difference. My oldest daughter, uh, Elisa, has been in Okinawa for the last two and a half years, uh, serving in the Navy. Um, she has uh, had a tremendous experience, life-changing experience there, uh, working as a medical first responder um, in many of the fire departments and the emergency department at a Navy hospital on that island of South Japan. Uh, we receive good news um, with prayer and love from many, including uh, our, our pastor, um, Isaac, uh, that she will be going to Camp Pendleton sometime in August or September and a lot closer to home to finish out her time. I will say of the three, Elisa has probably got this special little uh, touch on her life um, from the get-go, out of the womb, I felt it. Uh, yes, it was 1.35 in the morning, and my wife just went through uh, uh, one of those amazing uh, events that you mothers have gone through in giving birth, but I felt it when she came out of the womb, and she has lived out the experience that I felt in a variety of different ways, some painful, many beautiful. She had a special touch. She would find money. I remember as a very young uh, toddler almost, we walked a neighborhood singing Christmas carols and out of the group, she was one that was called out by one of our neighbors and given, I don't know, like 40 bucks for the entertainment. Riding a bike. Before Del Alma Mall got big and fancy like it is now, I remember taking Samuel and her over to a wide open parking lot and having the task to help her to learn how to ride a bike. Samuel almost had it down, was doing pretty good. She was the one whose attention my effort was focused on. I got behind her as you normally do when you try to help a young child ride a bike, and we were making some laps in the parking lot. And I only had to make about one and a half. 
And that little girl got the knack of how to keep that bike underneath her, and she was off and riding in a big, old, massive loop in the parking lot. And she made that big loop and came around and a big old smiling face all over her. And then she ran into a curb, fell off the bike and yelled out really loud, my nuts. I've been asked to share something about marriage. Marriages that honor God. It's in the series that our senior pastor has wisely put in front of us to learn a bit about the family and to spend some time on this precious gift called the family. Just thinking about this amazing church that we have, where we have this glorious worship, where we focus our attention on the living God in our midst. And then after that, we have this wonderful opportunity to hear about the activities of the church that make this a family church, because they're all about human interaction human fellowship, human education, human service to one another. Marriage fits into that category, and I've asked to share about marriages that honor God. When I was given that task, my mind went real quick to a couple named Irma and Joe Garcia. Irma, a teacher in a fourth grade class, shot and killed by an 18-year-old confused man whom evil got a hold of. She died in that classroom. And I believe it was about two days later where her husband, Joe, went to her memorial that was established outside the school to lay down flowers and two hours later dropped dead in his house of a heart attack. Some would say from a broken heart. Is that honor? Might be. Certainly a lot of love and devotion that was devastated by evil. You and me, if we've had any chance to be around a TV or a computer terminal or a smartphone, we've seen the debacle of a marriage by someone with the last name of Depp and Heard. What in the heck is our fascination with such a mess? Is that a marriage that honors God? It is one of our highest duties as a creation of God to honor that same God who created each and every one of us gathered here this morning and that breathe in air on this planet called Earth. Marriages need a little mercy now. There are many texts in scripture about marriage. There is one in Hebrews that says marriage should be honored. And then it talks about what should happen in the marriage bed. Not going to happen here this morning. We'll have to come for another sermon at another time. I've chosen to share with you a short text of incredible ancient wisdom from the book of Proverbs, verse 3, chapter 3, verse 3 and 4. 
Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name in the sight of God and man. Amen. The amens have it. There was a Swiss thinker and Christian psychiatrist named Paul Tournier. He said, there are two things we cannot do alone. One is to be married and the other is to be a Christian. He also said that no one can develop freely in this world and find a full life without feeling understood by at least one person, spouse or other believer, why fellowship is so important. So for the most part, we are all, each and every one of us in this gathering, connected to this topic. Back to Elisa and her bike injury. I'd like to propose that marriage is in fact like riding a bike. This beginner's luck isn't just in your head, a new marriage. It's in your body too. In the early stages of falling in love, most of us know it, there's neurotransmitters and hormonal changes which create a whole new party inside of you and it can feel powerful. In that time period, the idea of having to work hard on staying connected may feel hard to grasp. And when you hear or read about how marriage can have challenges, you may, you may even think to yourself, we're different. Or, well, they don't have what we have. But after that initial phase, many couples find things start to get real. And the relationship just doesn't carry itself as it may have in the beginning. When a child is first learning how to ride a bike, there are times when an adult will give them a strong push. The child pedals, and you can see the face of excitement as the child thinks that they are actually riding the bike on their own. But when the momentum of that first push wears off, the child needs to keep pedaling and stay balanced and focused. Once that initial moment, it's time to work. Once that initial moment of falling in love wears off, the couple has to pedal harder. At times, it can feel arduous, like biking uphill. There can be times where it feels like you have the wind at your back. There can be times where it's slow and leisurely, and there can be times you fall off and need help. These shifts are pretty common. You know it, right? And the fact that it takes effort to keep a relationship in balance is a fact, not a failure. I want to take a moment just to show, um, show you all a couple that have honored God by their marriage for 58 years. Would you please stand? Dora Lee, Pastor Ray, 58 years of marriage. Now, some of you may be married and feel like Pastor T when he came up here and said, I didn't think I was might even going to make it. You may have just made another day or got up another morning without killing each other. God bless you. Yeah. 
honoring marriage. Dating and finding a compatible relationship can be a long journey with painful twists and turns. And it should be. Marriage remains one of the biggest structural and emotional decisions one makes in life. And yes, even after finding that right partner, we both, you both have to work individually so that couple continues. You know, there's something interesting, isn't it, about two individuals coming together, a husband and wife, mostly in this church, that's what we talk about. Um, but each of you come as unique individuals. Him and her, you stand before God. One of the things that I think needs to pay be paid some good deal of attention to is yes, we need to pay attention to each individual and the couple, but it's the and that counts. Him and her, husband and wife, the end is what's important and what I think we can focus on this morning. Because that's often the hardest part for us to understand is the end. What is it that happens when a man and a woman come together in a marriage? What is it that happens when within fellowship there is something that's shared in ministry? What happens between us as people of God? That and is something that is very, very important to pay attention to. It's not just two individuals coming together, but what happens when they come together is something that is precious and very much a part of what God does in our lives. Marriage is like riding a bike. It's an analogy that works in a lot of ways. I learned to ride a bike. My dad was a very busy man, worked a tremendous amount, loved his family and wanted to support them with everything in his being. Some might call that workaholic. The man loved us. He loved his job and he did the best he could. He had enough of an opportunity to start me out on my bike. He gave me a few good pushes. I wasn't as quick a learner as my daughter, Elisa. I didn't quite get it down when I was with my dad. And he went off to work. I lived at 1967 Cumbre Drive across the street from Friendship Park in San Pedro. Up on Cumbre Drive, our, our driveway had a little bit of an incline, just enough where I could get on my Schwinn Stingray with the banana seat and handlebars and push off down that driveway, give me enough uh, force and motion to be able to get my bike riding skills under control. And I finally got it. And just as I got it, my dad was riding down the street and parked in the driveway and I could not wait for him to get out the car. Dad, 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 come here. Look, look, I got it. I got it. So he climbed out of the car, put his briefcase down and watched me standing on top of the driveway, push myself down the driveway and onto the sidewalk. And I was pedaling like a madman, looking down at the sidewalk, feeling all kinds of joy and good things inside. And I looked up and to my amazement, there were two ladies standing right in the middle of the sidewalk. I did a quick left turn, stayed on the bike, ran into a bunch of ivy, and looking down, I saw no more ivy but a very small poodle that I T-boned and went flying off over my bike and landed on the street. Picked myself up, too embarrassed to even dress, address the two ladies that were tending to a yelping dog and walked myself back home. Man. Sometimes marriages don't start off the way they should. Sometimes marriages start difficult. You may be here, and quite frankly, I don't want to make little of this. 
You may be here and the product of a marriage that started in a very difficult way and did not survive or is barely hanging in there. And the pain that you feel is something that I hope you know is very important. Is very important to the people of God and the God who created us. The pain that comes from a broken marriage is certainly something that we see in a, in a grotesque, entertaining way on court TV when a couple are talking about how damaging their relationship was to one another. You may have felt more pain than they could ever have imagined. You may be feeling that pain more than they could have ever imagined. And you don't have 10 million or $2 million coming your way. You have to figure out how to make it every single day in the midst of that pain, trusting in the God who loves you and is sustaining you and we guarantee will continue to love you. As an individual, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. In that marriage, we can't say. And it must be said, does God honor marriages that don't survive? I'm not the authority, but I do know that we serve a God who would respect and honor anybody who got out of a marriage that was abusive and devastating and defeating to any person's soul. I do believe God would honor that. Marriages do not always start best way and we know that the stigma of divorce in this day and age is not what it used to be marriages get thrown away faster than they're created we know that there's truth in that but there's nothing to celebrate in that it's just a statement about the current condition of our marriages in this country and a lot of them have to do with the fact that they start off in a bad way it is why it is so important to make that choice. It is why I've had so many conversations with my son and probably to the point of annoying him when we carpool up the 405 in the morning about the woman that he may someday marry. It's precious. It's important to have a good fresh start. And this is horrible, but I, I, I'm a chaplain. I work in healthcare. I have a role of being a spiritual leader and get to meet families in their deepest crisis. But at the same time, I meet and come alongside amazing physicians and nurses and other important people who work in the world of helping people. They're not always the best and healthiest people themselves. But I sometimes become for them a little pastor and I'm asked to marry them. And I remember on one occasion, I was asked to, to marry a couple, a very well-known heart surgeon and a nurse that he met in the midst of work. And I, I, I got together with them because I'd like to have a couple conversations before we did the big ceremony. And I looked at the surgeon and I said, why do you love her? Why do you want to get married? And he looked at me with silence. And then he said, she's good in bed. That's a bad start. That's a bad start. Not the most proudest, not the proudest time of my life of ministry. I just felt like I could do maybe what little I could given to this busy couple by interjecting some form of love and the presence of God. They didn't make it. They didn't make it. There are a lot of marriages that have a rough start that don't make it. And there are some that are and that do. What happens? Passion dies down. All kinds of reasons, right? Familiarity sets in. Stress, age, health issues. You know, evolution says that we're predisposed to become obsessed with a new partner to bond with. The early stage, the heady stage of passion, when we're high on that cocktail of brain chemicals, 
that it typically starts dropping off after two years? That's what science says. Steve Harvey proved that one time. I have fun watching some of those YouTube clips for Family Feud. Two men on each side of the podium. Steve Harvey standing up there with his card. Name a reason a man thinks his wife looks as young as she did the day that he married her. Bam. Alcohol. Steve Harvey said, that is the best answer I've ever heard that's likely not up there. Man, sometimes it seems like love is defined by whatever we can still betray. I want to do right, but not right now. Some do not know how to trust God through this relationship, through this pain. What does God honor? God honors your trust, that fragile thing that's hard to hang on to. Human nature, what's the deal with us? I was talking to somebody about the fact that there was a time about 12 years ago when I had a type of uh, cancer inside of me that put me real close to death. And a lot of you were here and a part of that and prayed for me and my family, and I am grateful. But how is it that I can be in a place where I feel like I wake up at three in the morning and I'm thinking about not being able to be a part of my family anymore? And then I find myself now at a point where I get frustrated when I get a cold, when I get angry, when someone cuts me off, when I get um, when I get depression over being in a certain place in life. What is it about human nature? What is it about our nature that when we know how powerful the love was that we had when we met somebody, fell in love with them and asked them to marry us and they said yes, that we get to a place where we start wandering with our eyes when we think about how it might be better somewhere else? What happens to us where when we lose that passion? What is it about this human nature? Why are we made this way? Well, I think one reason is, is that We're called to live in the real world with real responsibility. There is nobody in this life that I've ever met that's been able to live on a high throughout their entire lifespan. Each and every one of us has felt that very passionate or that very high on something that occurred by winning a championship, by being successful, by having accomplished so much in life by being in love and feeling like it changed the world, but then having it all kind of settle down, draw us into confusion, and we start thinking about everything else but that first love or that ability to survive a life and death situation? Have we not all been called to live a life of responsibility out of the mundane, everyday situations where we get the daily double like Pastor Isaac has shared with us, that we get up, we wake up, and we get up? What is it about us that the daily double isn't just quite enough? I think what it is, is it tells us that God wants us to live out this life in those very moments with one another, being in incredibly deep responsibility with the faithfulness that it takes to be a saint in the way that we call a saint a saint here at Mission Ebenezer Family Church. And that is anybody who's making it, walking with God, is a saint in my eyes. That we have been called to be responsible with our daily frustrations, our daily obligations, our daily disappointments, our daily confusions, and be faithful to the living God who has never abandoned us, will never abandon us. One of my seminary professors, which was a long time ago, so long that I can't remember what he said verbatim, I'm going to have to read it to you. 
The astonishing and astounding fact is this. Humanity is by its very nature healing. It is grounded in the very said humanity. It is not in the removal of pathology that we are healed and whole. To put it in another way, being human requires openness to the other and permission for the other to touch the core of our being. Adam expressed it in an amazingly concrete terms as bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This helping and healing encounter integrates the self with itself as well as with the other as necessary for one's selfhood. All subsequent therapy, whether physical, psychical, social, or spiritual, is grounded in this core therapy of being human. We are healing to one another. We are healing to one another. But it takes that radical uh, uh, time to think and reflect upon the and between you and me, between him and her, her and him. It's that and where the healing can occur. If we trust in the living God who brings us together as people in fellowship, as people in marriage. Oh, I got to wrap this up. I can't wait. We got communion right here like old school days. What a blessing. Two other analogies. You know, science cannot figure out how a bicycle can self-correct itself. If you take a bike and you push it hard enough, that bike will correct itself until it loses enough momentum and falls down. They cannot figure it out. Is it the motion of the wheels? They thought it was. Is it the fact that there is a, 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 a what do they call, a canister wheel to, uh, where it follows behind? They thought it was. There is still a mystery about that. But a bike stays up because it corrects itself. When you're riding it, you have to learn how to correct yourself. There is something that we must do as men and women, as women and men, as people in fellowship to learn how to correct ourselves as people of faith. How do we keep that bike underneath us? Or how do we keep the foundation of the truth about the importance of getting on, giving honor to God underneath us? We have to learn how to correct ourselves. It is important that we learn from this place of ministry where we learn about life on how to correct ourselves. What does it mean to become a part of Mission Ebenezer Family Church? But to know that there is a resource that helps us correct ourselves as we go through this life day in and day out. But there's a caution there. Because we know that when we understand, correct ourselves, it's cause and effect. The bike moves this way, you turn this way. The bike moves this way, you turn this way. If there's anything I've learned the hard way in life, life is not about cause and effect. Sometimes when you correct this way, it doesn't work out that way. Sometimes when you think you do your part in the marriage that you're going to get that part back in return. Sometimes when you do this, you think you should get that and it don't work that way. I was riding down Venice Way, correcting myself on my bike, and some idiot turned right in front of me, and I T-boned the side of his car, hit the sidewalk, and flew off. I was laying there in a daze, just wanting to make sure that everything was okay, and thank God it was. And I even got some money out of it, so how about that? A little bit of cause and effect, but it wasn't what I was looking for. Let me end it with this. I have the privilege of writing. I'm, I, I see you, man. I got you. Thank you for your patience, Carlos. I, um, I have the, the benefit and blessing of working up in Santa Monica, California. As I said, I go up with my son, carpool up 405 when he goes off into the valley. He drops me off at work at St. John's Health Center on Santa Monica Boulevard, 2121. I get out of the car with Samuel and I take a bike. 
and I put it in my office. I charge that bike up, and when I'm done with work, I get on Arizona Boulevard, and I fly down to Ocean Boulevard, and then I fly down Ocean Boulevard to well, an alley on Venice, Speedway it's called. Oh, man, there's entertainment on every side of me. Then it opens up to Marina Del Rey, and then I'm flying down the bike path, ocean on my side, and you know how I do it every day in just over an hour, 24 miles in just over an hour. I've got this fancy bike. It's called a Specialized, and it's got a motor inside of it. And when I pedal that thing, it goes. It goes and it goes. I can get that thing almost up to 30 miles an hour. The tagline for Specialized, it says, you only faster. And I love that. And to me, I'm going to close it out with this idea, right? That bike is me only faster. You know what relationship is? You know what marriage is? When you allow your marriage to honor God, it's you and her and her and him, you and you only faster when you allow the covenant relationship to be a part of who you are. It is not a contract that you have between a man and a woman. It is a covenant relationship that God has, de de has devoted himself to. Can you trust God? You can trust God because you did nothing. And you know what God did? He gave his son for you and me. You did nothing for that. And he gave his son for you and me that you and I would be able to know what it's like to live in that covenant relationship. And so when you think about a husband and wife, I sure hope that you have the privilege and the ability to know that that covenant relationship is shrouded in that love and devotion to you. That it is you and her, but only hotter. You think those early times of marriages are hot? They are. But it's you and the other person only hotter by the spiritual presence of the loving God in the end between you and the other person. May we live in that and celebrate that in Jesus' name.